not only children but caregivers as well. So if we were to kind of start out by just describing attachment itself, it is attachment is a is a is a biological uh, experience. Attachment is a psychological experience and a social experience, all wrapped up into one. One of the things that's incredibly important in terms of um, developing a sense of attachment is that that caregiver that you're so dependent on maintains some proximity with you and maintains some um, closeness to you so that your immediate needs can be met as an infant. Um, attachment is based on the need to survive, frankly, biologically speaking. Infants on some psychic level know that they are totally and totally completely helpless in the world and that there is a real biological drive being expressed in, in the need to attach, in addition to the psychological and emotional needs and the social needs, etc. Um, so attachment is an interesting theory because it really very equally wraps up all of those things. And when, when you start to look at an infant, and in this case we're talking about a mother, it's interesting as a side note that attachment sort of brings up a lot of gendered language about who the primary caregiver is and I try to remember that when I when I when I talk and I try to use the term caregiver instead of necessarily mother because it, it doesn't always necessarily have to be mother obviously who is the primary caregiver it can certainly be uh, a father or a grandparent or a foster parent or a relative other than the mother um, but that's a little bit of an aside. I think during the slide I might lapse into talking about the mother because that, that is sort of the stereotypical uh, primary attachment figure. But that you're looking at uh, essentially two major types and three subtypes of, of attachment. Secure attachment and insecure attachment. One of the things that you can see as you look at this slide is that the vast majority, 65% of newborns are going to uh, develop a secure attachment with their caregivers. And so that's very optimistic, and that's that's a, that's a nice statistic to see, um, that even with various failings, with even the mistakes that you make, with even as parents or caregivers, times that you screw up or times that you don't do things the way you think you should, the reality is is that if you're quote unquote good enough, um, as Winnicott would say, then you're likely to develop a child with a healthy and a secure attachment. But of course, in social work practice, we tend to see more of children and their caregivers who have a more insecure type of attachment. And so of that insecure type, you, we, have th we have three um, different types, which is ambivalent. And this is where um, a child is very kind of concerned and nervous or kind of anxious about getting their needs met and because that uh, caregiver is not necessarily consistent or because that caregiver might be preoccupied and not really able to give that child full attention. Uh, you might see this, for example, a lot with a substance abusing parent. Um, the baby is is nervous, frankly, about getting their needs met and, and they're constantly checking and rechecking and they can't really be independent and they can't really develop on their own um, strategies to kind of calm down. They're sort of nervously, anxiously looking for their caregiver to comfort them. Um, the opposite extreme would be a, a child who develops an avoidant attachment style, which is pretty much where they shut you out, where they kind of say, you know, I think I'm better off really shutting down, turning inward, you know, depending only on myself, you see in some ways kind of a, a counter-dependent uh, um, kind of behavior forming. And, and certainly you see this later on uh, in later childhood and adolescence and even in adulthood, the kind of person who is really more counter-dependent than, say, over-dependent. Um, the last stage, uh, or the last rather insecure type of attachment would be disorganized attachment. And this is a very severe kind of attachment disorder, attachment um, problem. And thankfully, it's it's theoretically the most unusual type. And usually, if you see something like this, it's um, it's very very severe family pathology that has kind of created this attachment style, which is that a child has absolutely no idea how to um, attach to a caregiver because nothing they try works. 
And so you can see generally extreme, extreme behavioral problems, head banging, self-harm, even, even in very, very young children, self-harm is something that we might associate more with adolescents and older. Um, a child who is desperate, desperate, desperate and, and clinging and when a caregiver might go to them, then they start to push away and bite them and arch their back and kick and try to get away. Um, so this kind of attachment style is, 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 is the most um, severely problematic. And really what it reflects is not necessarily uh, a pathology within the baby per se, but that this child has been completely overwhelmed by an environment that is um, completely unable to meet their needs in terms of their physical needs, their psychological needs, their social needs. And so kind of that last statement about the baby is in a, just a complete state of unresolved angst. And, you know, in class, we can certainly talk more about how you might see that in older children or teens. Generally speaking, unfortunately, social work tends to see more kinds of kids with disorganized attachments, particularly if you're talking about maybe kids with uh, a lot of disruptions, foster care, early losses, things like that, that have, have um, really kind of severely damaged a child's sense of stability in the world. These are the kids that, that sadly are kind of at most risk for something like this happening. Um, extreme abuse and extreme neglect are other reasons why you might see this happening. And so unfortunately, So you might find yourself wondering how we, um, in the academic world, have come to identify these these three kinds of attachment styles, primarily the avoidant, the secure, which is hopefully what you, what you see most of the time, and sort of that anxious, ambivalent type of attachment. Um, it is sort of the classic Mary Ainsworth study of the strange situation, and we might refer to this in class. It's a, a, a brief video that kind of shows these things, and I have some other films that I'm going to kind of... Um, uh, intersperse here. And actually, you know what, I actually do have a small clip of the strange situation study that we can see while you while you look at this podcast. Uh, and they and they kind of describe the different types and how they happen and what the um, what the uh, implication of that is. So kind of with that, I'm going to go over to the films and embed those so that you can see what I'm what I'm speaking of. children at home, a student of Bowlby's, Mary Ainsworth, devised such a procedure called the strange situation, which places the child under some stress. It has become the most widely used standardized way to assess the quality of a child's attachment to their caregiver. Here the researchers are recording how 14-month-old Lisa responds in this attractive but unfamiliar setting. How will she react to a stranger? What will happen when her mother leaves the room? And when she returns? It's Lisa's behavior when her mother returns, what psychologists call the reunion, that they are particularly interested in. The most important thing is to look for the type of balance that a child strikes between an attachment to need and on the other hand to explore the play material. Once Lisa has settled down to play, a stranger enters the room and sits in the chair reading a magazine. After a couple of minutes, the stranger attempts to interact with Lisa. Soon after, Lisbeth gets a cue to leave the room. The stranger tries to comfort Lisa, but in vain. Lisbeth comes back into the room, and the camera records how Lisa reacts. Now the first part. 
part of the procedure is over, and Lisbeth settles Lisa down again. The stranger leaves them alone together. And soon after, Lisbeth goes too. Lisa is on her own. Her distress is plain to see. Once again, the efforts of the stranger to console Lisa are to no avail. But Lisbeth manages to calm her almost at once, and shortly afterwards, the observation ends. Lisa showed outward signs of what's called secure attachment. So what you see there is the Ainsworth study that highlights the characteristics of, of secure attachment in that um, the child uses the parent as that secure base to explore what's around them and to explore the toys and etc. And they're, the child itself is, is not particularly too happy that a stranger is involved in their life. They're, they're wary of that person. And if the parent is there, you see that the stranger in the room becomes um, somebody to explore and, and be curious about, but always in the context of feeling secure that the parent is there with them. Um, so like that little clip showed, the real uh, sort of evidence of secure attachment isn't necessarily seen when the parent leaves the room, that actually you would expect a securely attached child to be very upset when the parent leaves the room. The real evidence of secure attachment is when that parent comes back and how quickly does that child settle down and how quickly can that parent engage that child in a soothing, comforting way, and that child can take it in and experience that and settle down. You know, in secure attachment with a with a caregiver who is generally available and shows a lot of warmth and support, that kind of comforting can happen very quickly. And you've probably seen this maybe in your own lives when you've encountered even with your own children or, or other children that you might be related to or close to, that that primary caregiver can generally calm that child much, much faster than uh, anyone else. And that's, of course, a good sign. Um, I have two other brief clips from a psychiatrist named Dan Siegel, who is a very famous child psychiatrist and is very, very well known in attachment circles. He's, a, he's an interesting presenter and he has a lot to say. And I have two um, clips of him talking about different kinds of attachment um, and, and attachment problems. So I'm gonna embed that also now. Some children then experience that there's no one to know. And there's this deep sense of emptiness. And what happens is, in those children grown into adolescents and then into adults that I work with, what I see is that the, the way they look at the world is as if the world were only one aspect, the physical aspect that which is touchable, measurable, weighable. And those people just see reality as purely on the physical plane of existence, this physical aspect of reality. So if you have a plane of reality, one side of that plane is physical. Of course the physical world is real. But another side that's equally real is the mental side, the subjective internal seed that fills us with feelings and thoughts and hopes and dreams, impulses, desires, longings. In the group of avoidantly attached kids, there's this amazing blindness to the sea inside. And this way of understanding it through the initial mirror neuron system interaction is that they don't have any experience that their caregivers saw that world, so that world is not created inside of themselves. organized attachment, unfortunately, what you see is the parents and other caregivers have provided terrifying experiences for a child. And these can be in the form of just parents looking terrified themselves. So because of our whole system of mirror neurons, we soak in what we see in others. So if I'm a baby and you are feeling uh, frightened and confused, I get frightened and confused just by your fear. And that in itself can create a dissociated state of fragmented internal sense of self. 
the other example would be if you were actually abusing me emotionally, physically, sexually, and I would develop uh, a dissociative condition as well. And that the research is very clear on that, that the bind for a child is that when a parent is either terrifying directly or looks terrified and therefore is terrifying, it puts the child in, in an untenable situation. There is no solution to the fear I experience because one part of my brain says, you know, I'm feeling fear, so I need to go toward my attachment figure to be soothed. But another part of my brain says, I'm feeling fear, I need to get away from the source of terror. So one part says, go to my attachment figure, the other part says, go away from my attachment figure, and there's no solution, there's literally no solution. The whole system collapses, and I fragment with dissociation. And when you follow these kids as they get older without treatment, what happens, unfortunately, is their ability to regulate their emotions is severely compromised. So if I feel angry, I can't calm it down. I can't make a separation between my impulse and my action. So there's a lot of acting out that is taking the inward world and acting it outwardly. Um, there's also a feeling of um, uh, inability to understand other people. And I, I get very disrupted by other people's emotions. So I can, I can have a a lot of trouble having intimate relationships that give me a sense of comfort and safety. And I may misinterpret people's reactions because the way the mirror neuron system we believe works is it learns from experience. So for example, if I've been abused as a child or you know, terrified by my, my caregivers and I'm just interacting with someone as an adult and that person raises her hand, well, if I never was abused, I might interpret the meaning of this raised hand as they're waving hello or asking a question or flagging a cab. But if I've been abused, my mirror neuron system automatically interprets the intention behind an action. And therefore, this action is I'm going to be struck by this person I'm talking with. So my action at that point is in my own brain. I develop a constant vigilance for are things safe or unsafe. And I'll interpret this as unsafe. And once I interpret it as unsafe, instead of being receptive to what the other person is saying, I become reactive. And when I become reactive, I go down one of three roads. I either feel totally hopeless and helpless, I can't do anything, and I freeze. It's one response. Or I feel like I'm massively in danger and I want to run, so I flee. And then the third option, which leads to violence, of course, is I fight. That within seconds, I interpret this act as a violent act. I go from receptivity to reactivity. I then have a choice of these three options. Am I helpless? No. Am I going to flee? No. Then I'm going to fight. And if I have no separation between the impulse to fight and just feel, oh, I'm angry, I'm seeing red, I better take a deep breath, I better walk away, I better take a few seconds between this impulse and the action, the action actually starts to generate its own violence. Because once I enact a violent behavior, then my whole system is put on alert that I'm engaged in a fight. And everything that I've grown up with from an evolutionary point of view, over millions of years of ultimately being a fish in a cave protecting the female that I'm laying eggs with, you know, I am going to fight to the death. And it becomes a matter of life and death. It's not just about this, you know, 100-year life I have. It's millions of years of history when the fight response becomes activated in the, from the brainstem, right? And so when there's a release of the cortical control over these subcortical impulses, then all sorts of things can happen that have an evolutionary basis to them, that are beyond even just my own personal history. Sure, I can enact the violence I saw when I was a kid and saw my father and mother fighting or the, the violence they enacted on me. Absolutely. No question about it. I can learn that. But I also have a whole brainstem fight response that I didn't need to learn anything about from anyone else but millions of years of genetic sculpting. So what Dan Siegel is talking about there is um, certainly something that we're going to talk an awful lot more about, but he gives you a little bit of the of the psychobiological um, 
reality of attachment and what that looks like. Um, these next slides here are just kind of um, summary slides if, if folks are more of a visual learner. Uh, here is sort of the subtypes of attachment, all the different ones we were just talking about. Here are some of the characteristics of secure attachment. I understand that you can probably look at this of course yourself uh, and see what that looks like in, in both children and adults. Here it is again for ambivalent attachment and avoidant attachment. Um, in the last moment when we were watching that clip about Dan Siegel, I thought one of the reasons I included that was I thought that he gave one of the best explanations for disorganized attachment, which is sometimes a, a, a difficult uh, thing to try to visualize or understand. And so he is, in, in that way, I think, making sense of one of the most um, serious and extreme kinds of attachment problems or attachment disorders. So what are some of the risk indicators that you might look for in, in young children that might indicate something going on with attachment? The idea of promiscuous affection or lack of affection. I think one of the things that you're going to notice as we uh, go through some of these points is that they are indicative of extremes. So on one end, of course, you have a complete lack of affection or, or a, a, a total uh, sort of shutting down of seeking out affection. And on the other hand, you have almost unsafe promiscuous affection looking to a total stranger or, or somebody that you just met for uh, fulfillment of some intense kind of need. Uh, lack or uh, an unusual way of um, seeking comfort, excessive dependence or independence, non-compliant or over-compliant, um, extreme fear or fearlessness in exploring an environment. And I think when you're talking about children and um, clinical work with children, one of the things that you would need to see is many of these things uh, over, t over time. Um, you wouldn't want to see a child for their first appointment, say, and uh, interpret their shyness as extreme fear of exploring their environment, say, or, or, or notice that their uh, inhibited way of moving around your office might, it, it might uh, be an indicator of a problem. So one of the things that when you think about attachment risk indicators, you're taking a history, of course, from the adults in that child's life, and you're listening for these themes, and then in your own contact with that child, you're um, looking for these things over time, a pattern of these things. And of course, the last point is incredibly important, which is the idea that um, different, different child-rearing practices in different cultures are going to uh, result in different kinds of behaviors and patterns. And of course, Every theory that we're going to talk about in this class certainly has a critique from a sociocultural point of view, and there are there are lots of theorists who would suggest that what I'm presenting to you now is really much more of a, again, kind of that white middle class standard of, of behavior and, and psychological theory, and we can certainly come back in class and talk more about that to um, talk about some of the alternative points of views about things like attachment and otherwise. Um, what are some of the factors of the caregivers that might result in attachment difficulties. I think that first point um, is one of the biggest ones, frankly. If they have their own history of loss or attachment difficulties, they are at a real, uh, they're, they're really struggling to be able to do that with their child. It's kind of like that classic, you can't give what you didn't get kind of idea. Um, we're going to talk in class about the ideas of temperament and goodness of fit, but sometimes, you know, they, you, people don't mesh well and sometimes parents get very rigid and children are very rigid and nobody can kind of compromise in, in a relational pattern and get really estranged from each other. Um, a very, very young parent is at a higher risk of attachment difficulties than an older parent just because of their own developmental needs oftentimes. And other, other, other kind of caregivers, other caregiver factors rather would be like their own mental health problems, their own substance abuse problems the amount of stress in their life and their ability, whether or not they have supportive relationships and whether or not they themselves towards their child are perpetrating uh, abuse or neglect. Some of the situational factors that, that can interfere with a healthy attachment forming has a lot to do with uh, lack of resources and the stress that comes with that. Um, if you were to look at these points here on the slide, 
all of these things, the, the resource issue, the poverty issue, having multiple separations or losses, a lack of social support, um, actually culture and ethnicity can be a, 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 a strength and not, not so much a risk. Uh, the experiences of racism or classism, say for example, these things are all uh, potential barriers to, to parents being able to have the time and energy and availability to create a healthy attachment. And so they're in there as factors uh, in both a potential risk or a potential form of resiliency. So this, again, kind of a visual learner slide, talks about how attachment unfolds. And it's kind of a flow chart, as you can see, in terms of what people are getting and how they might respond. And so that top section is uh, indicative of secure attachment, and the bottom section is um, indicative of what could be become avoidant or what could be become preoccupied or, um, or anxious. And so one of the things that we will also talk about in the next presentation where we do a more advanced discussion of attachment and interpersonal trauma is the ways in which attachment disruption as a result of trauma, say for example, uh, affects many different domains in someone's life. We'll talk about uh, the physiological, neurobiological uh, effect of an attachment disruption, how that affects cognitions and thinking patterns that develop and, and a sense of a sense of self, uh, the emotional dysregulation, the difficulty in interpersonal relationships. Every arrow that you see on this slide represents a domain, not only of attachment, but of uh, areas that are affected by trauma. And we will come back to this slide in the next presentation to talk a little bit more about it. This next slide is another visual slide that talks about uh, the resulting extremes of difficulty that somebody might have in, um, in attachment difficulties. And so in the center, you see the self-regulatory kind of subsystems that, that a healthy, secure attachment means that you are physiologically, physically well-regulated, that you have decent emotional regulation, decent regulation in terms of one's thoughts and one's ability to be flexible in one's thinking, that your behavior is pretty well-regulated, that you have a cohesive sense of self, and that you have a, a, a solid sense of interpersonal related, relatedness. So if you're doing well with all of those categories inside the circle, then the likelihood is that you have healthy attachment, healthy attachment system around you, and therefore you are doing well in these sort of subsystems. But each color on the squares around the circle indicate the extreme. And so for example, the blue square under physiology, one extreme would be hyper arousal, one of those things like the fight response that, that Siegel was talking about in that earlier clip. The other, if you follow that line to the other side of the circle under physiology is dissociation. That is the other extreme, checked out, numbed out, blank, missing. And so each one of these squares are color coded and they have a dialectic, an opposite. So for example, uh, cognitions. For attachment, one of the things that's happening cognitively is uh, you're taking in a cognitive schema, which in attachment language is called the inner working model, the IWM. And it's kind of your thought blueprint for what to expect from people and what to expect from relationships. And um, having, a, having a, a sense of oneself and, and, and a sense of what your expectations are of other people. And so in one extreme, you have a very negative um, perception of yourself and you think very negatively of yourself and you have a, a, a real cognitive schema of negativity about yourself. And the other might be, um, if you were to follow that line to the other side of the purple box, maybe a more grandiose sort of overly positive sense of self or others kind of idealizing uh, either any of those extremes represents a problematic uh, state to be in because obviously what you want are the shades of gray in the middle um, and not the extremes indicated on the outside squares. So one of the things that is the result of um, positive attachment is a sense that uh, you're starting to get to know yourself and therefore other people. First you kind of understand who you are and then you differentiate and understand others. 
And, and this kind of cognitive ability is really even present at birth, where children are, are actually able to see that they are separate now from their primary caregivers. And you can see evidence of this around 16 months when children can recognize themselves in the mirror and they can recognize that someone who is not them is not them. Um, more development of self comes by age two, sort of the classic terrible twos where children can express uh, their own sense of agency and their own sense of will by being able to say no to everything. And they, at that point at age two, can also look around and get a sense of how they should be responding to things uh, by watching how other people respond. And that, I think, also comes back to Siegel's point where he was talking about uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sub a, an objectively terrifying event, say for example, it can be a subjectively terrifying event that, that if your own parent is not perpetrating something terrifying upon you, just to see them disorganized and uh, kind of decompensating and terrifying is enough. You can see that that's also dangerous. Um, so that's partly the sort of the building blocks of self-awareness. This next slide talks about temperament, and I'm sure we're going to talk more about temperament in class, in person. Um, one of the things that, that is helpful sometimes in, in a conceptualization of temperament is to think of temperament almost as the, the biological building blocks of what will become personality. If temperament is really biologically based, personality is uh, taking what is biologically kind of given and having the influence of psychological and social factors to create personality. So if temperament is a biologically based um, reality, then personality is more of a psychologically and socially sh sculpted uh, result. And so temperament, of course, plays a big part in what will eventually become someone's personality. It's kind of the first step. And so when you look at infants, say for example, one of the things that will tip you off about whether or not they have a very easy temperament or kind of the spectrum of more difficult temperaments is how active they are, uh, whether they have regular biological rhythms, do they have a feeding schedule that they follow, do they have uh, do they are they constipated or do they have sort of regular bowel movements all of those things kind of relate to rhythms and regularity um, do they have a consistent pattern of approaching or withdrawing are they adaptable can you can you take this child and and within reason change their environment and can they roll with that or do they become very upset and sort of dysregulated these next slides kind of res are our discussion about sensory responses. Are they extremely um, are they extremely sensitive to various sensory inputs, or are they more able to roll with that? How quickly do they respond to something? What is the intensity of their emotional reactions to some stimulus? Kids that have a very strong and intense emotional reaction oftentimes have a corresponding difficulty in settling down. And so that might kind of put them more on the difficult end. And, you know, what is their just overall mood? If you think about the talking twin video that we saw, you know, certainly people remarked that these look like very happy kids. They look like kids who are generally in a positive mood. And not that they don't, um, uh, not that they don't have difficulties from time to time, um, but they, but they generally are speaking maybe in a more optimistic, happy mood. And so, all of this stuff around attachment and early development really depends on all of these factors that you see here on this slide. Um, goodness of fit is an important characteristic which refers to how well that caregiver and that and that child sort of fit together. You know, is the relationship difficult? Is it easy? And you can certainly see this with parents and caregivers. There are some parents that find it very, very difficult to engage their child and to soothe their child and to settle their child down and to serve as kind of the ex external uh, stress regulator. And they just they just rub each other the wrong way, frankly. Um, and so that happens sometimes and secure attachment still happens, but um, a lot of times that's a, a kind of an early red flag for what might be a later attachment problem. And the hard part is is that both child and caregiver bring uh, 
uh, brings stuff to that dynamic, that, that difficult goodness of fit, say. But what's sometimes hard, what sometimes is hard when you're working with families is that it really becomes the adult responsibility to change and adapt. Uh, depending on the age of the child, of course, the younger the child is, the harder it's going to be for them to do that. And so one of the things that parents can really struggle with is that if they're, if they're experiencing that conflict or that not so goodness of fit with their child, it really kind of becomes on them to be, to the, the changing and the, and the, and the uh, sort of altering their behavior. Parental empathy, um, I'm looking at that particular point, that is a huge, huge, huge piece. And one of the um, kind of major indicators of child maltreatment or, or serious attachment problems is if a parent routinely and chronically cannot express a sense of empathy for their child when their child is experiencing difficulty, they're very invalidating or they're very uh, almost cold to the the experience of their child and you know we have certainly all maybe had our bad parenting moments where we're not the most responsive but you're looking again at trends and patterns um, a parent with their own history of course abuse and neglect has a, a major uh, hurdles overcome in connecting and attaching to their child the number of other children that's kind of sometimes a very interesting uh, point to bring out that generally speaking in very large families with lots of kids uh, you can see some attachment disruptions between parent and and child uh, but what you also might see is compensatory attachments forming among the siblings and so it's sort of a, a plus and a minus I suppose depending on what you're seeing so one of the reasons for that of course is just time and energy and resources if you have a very big family with lots of children um, you you, you might really physically not have time to care for them all well enough. You might manage to achieve caring for them all physically well enough, but you might not be able to have the time and energy and capacity to meet all of the tremendous demands of m many, many children, psychologically speaking, socially speaking, etc. So these are all uh, kind of major factors in attachment and early development. Um, and they all, they all have their... Um, strengths and weaknesses to many extents, but, but many of them are sort of hazards. So what is sort of the main point of this slide? It's talking about the social and environmental strengths and hazards. So in some ways, uh, a lot of marginalized communities might have developed their own informal support systems for parents and children, and that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, sort of sociological and social worky and psychological uh, accomplishment that, that in lieu of not having um, enough resources. They create very creative ways to meet those needs. But there are also obviously some very major obstacles and they're listed there. I mean, if you were to think about the hazards or the obstacles, what you're really thinking about those, those items as things that erect a barrier to to parents spending quality time with their children, frankly, and those things that might interfere with a parent um, being able to form that kind of lasting and healthy relationship. So for example, substandard or dangerous housing conditions, all of these items, like for example, that one and all the rest of them, they pile on more and more and more stress onto parents. And the more multi-stressed a parent is, the more difficult say for example it would be to spend the time and energy and availability to connect and to develop a strong attachment with their child now that's not to say of course that every parent who experiences these factors that that the second point is talking about uh, cannot form a secure attachment of course many 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 uh, parents do and um, remembering that secure attachment is uh, achieved 65% of the time. Certainly, certainly that's across all kinds of examples of risks and resiliencies. And so, so it's not, certainly not to say that if you were to see somebody in some of the situations that are described here, you would automatically go to be thinking about attachment disorders. But if you think about it in the reverse, if you see a child who's having attachment difficulties with a caregiver, it's also not uncommon to see some of these factors um, at play. Much, much faster than uh, anyone else, and that's of course a good sign. Um, I have two other brief clips from 
psychiatrist named Dan Siegel, who is a very famous child psychiatrist and is very, very well known in attachment circles. He's, a, he's an interesting presenter and he has a lot to say. And I have two um, clips of him talking about different kinds of attachment um, and, and attachment problems. So I'm going to embed that also now. of love. 